Good evening. Welcome everyone to tonight's Makri Talk. My name is Sarah Zanaida Gould, and I'm the Executive Director of the Mexican American Civil Rights Institute. Tonight, we are joined by Dr. Christian Pais, author of a new book titled, The Strikers of Coachella, a rank and file history of the UFW movement. It was just released earlier this year by the University of North Carolina Press. Uh, welcome, Dr. Pais. Thank you, Sarah. Uh, should I just jump in? As you, yeah. Uh, as, as you may know, communities across the United States are getting ready to celebrate Cesar Chavez's birthday on March 31st, which is now a holiday in several places. And in some cities, like in San Antonio, where I am, mm -hmm. there will be a Cesar Chavez march this Saturday. But as Cesar Chavez was known to say, the fight is never about grapes or lettuce, it's always about people. And so we're really pleased to have Dr. Bayus with us today because his book is all about the people who powered the farm workers labor movement. I would like to turn it over to you, Dr. Bayus. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sorry for jumping in earlier. Um, <laughs> something that I tell people is that I haven't done presentations since the pandemic started. So I feel incredibly rusty and uh, generally uh, very intimidated, <laughs> like a high school student giving a presentation in class. Um, oh. But let me, so thank you, Sarah, for, for, for the introduction and, uh, and for the invitation to speak. This is uh, my first book talk outside of one college campus. Uh, I'm excited to be with uh, Macri and I'm excited to, know, to learn more about Mac, Macri's uh, efforts and ideally some way that I can collaborate in some, you know, like the, with research and like presentations and in many ways to, to do a lot of the common work that we're doing in Coachella Valley as well. So, um, you know, I don't, I don't know who, who's here, right? But I, I want to thank you for, for having, uh, having me here and for dedicating a part of your early, early evening, if not your late afternoon. Um, I'm excited to, to share this work and I'm hopeful that, um, that if, if this resonates with you or if you see some of the work that we can do together to, uh, for you to reach out to me and, you know, I'm, I'm just finishing the book and I'm excited about how we can apply it in many different communities. Um, so let's see, let me, uh, so should we, should we jump in at the, with the, with the lecture? Yeah, That'd be yeah. fantastic, yeah. And, you know, we're gonna have a, a Q and A, right? So we'll, any questions, any thoughts, anything that you may uh, want to offer, uh, please feel free to, to, to do so. Uh, I'll be, I'm planning to do a whole couple years of just visiting different college campuses, especially the college campuses that are being served uh, or that are serving um, farm worker communities, uh, Latinx and communities, people of color, underrepresented groups. Um, and so any any thoughts, any, any questions, any suggestions that you have, please let me know. And if anything sticks out to you that you think is especially good, let me know also that that helps me keep a sense of what I'm doing in these talks. Okay, so let me just jump in into this thing and then uh, and then we'll try to get to the major theme. So as Sarah said, I'm an assistant professor in ethnic studies. I'm at UC Berkeley. This is my seventh year and uh, and and I'm in the comparative ethnic studies section of, of our department, which is a, a, a studies that is attempting to, sh to do a lot of the interracial work that I think some of our Chicanx scholars have been advocating for for, for, for a while now. I, um, I'm a historian by trade, as they say. Like I'm a, I, was, I, I went to USC at, in Los Angeles. I worked with uh, Professor George Sanchez, uh, Bill Deverall, um, uh, Juan de Lara and Marjorie Becker. So if you if you know who they are or if you've read their work, uh, you'll know that they, they put a lot of emphasis on the, the material world that people inhabit, the various ways that they attempt to make sense of their world and to shape it, and then ultimately the, the value of our scholarship in, in drawing multiple communities into conversation with each other. And this is how I see um, this book. It's a, it's a labor of love, like most of our books. It's, uh, it's, it's a book that is um, it's focused on my childhood community of the Coachella Valley. And it's one that attempts to focus on the rank and file, the regular members of this movement. So if you don't know what the UFW is or what Coachella is, I'll be covering that in a minute. 
but uh, you, I want to kind of touch on a few points right now with the cover of the of the of the book. So you'll see the cover it says the Strikers of Coachella. This is a cover that the UNC Press uh, uh, designed with collaboration with me. They're they're a wonderful press, and they have this fantastic series called Justice Power Politics. So if you like this book or these themes, uh, you should check out their series. They have a wonderful set of of scholars who who have published works on social movements, interracial movements, and their implications for our lives today. Now, if you take a look at the cover, you'll see a very, very daunting desert, right? Um, it's uh, sandy, there's some sagebrush. Uh, you don't see any animals in this photo. And then you see this kind of vague outline of mountains at the end. Uh, generally speaking, I think that these photos uh, were indicative of early 20th century white imaginations. They they imagined the desert as, as, a, as an empty space, as a space that had been underutilized by the indigenous Kauia or as a space that needed to be transformed by way of white ingenuity. And, and then for, for these settlers, they would argue uh, white superiority. Um, to me, this, this cover is also a way to show the labor that was expended in order to be able to transform this region into an agricultural landscape. Um, the region itself is in Southern California. And it is, uh, if you take a look at the, at the title, The Strikers of Coachella, Coachella is generally now, I think, a, a, is known uh, often for the Coachella Music Festival that takes place every year in April. So this year, I think Bad Bunny is headlining the concert. And I think that gets a lot of attention. And in many ways, that's a good thing. You know, uh, music is great. Art is great. It's wonderful that people are going to uh, conferences. But in doing so, and pe when people show up, I don't think they realize that there's this long, long, long history of people trying to imagine a world in which labor is dignified, in which uh, food is shared or, uh, or available, uh, where violence is uh, mitigated, if not completely eliminated, and where there is a real democratic tenor to everyday life in, in rural California. So for anyone who's going to Coachella, or if you have a younger person in your life who wants to go to Coachella, this is, you know, send them this book or send them the intro or even this lecture, and I hope you know, if they have any questions, they can direct it to me. Uh, let's see, Sarah, can we go to the next slide, please? So uh, today I am thinking four parts and I'll be trying, I'll try to go as quickly as I can, uh, but I think we may only be able to get to part one and two and maybe a kind of like a brief synopsis of the organization and argument. But I wanna spend some time at the beginning to talk about the UFW uh, and then to talk a little bit about how I am approaching the book. And then from there, uh, I wanna talk a little bit about my personal life and Coachella today, and then, uh, and then maybe kind of conclude on those, on those terms, okay? And this is, uh, this is my very first copy. I had just finished a bunch of work. I got a the physical copy, I took a photo, and about two minutes later, my cats ate like the corners of every single, <laughs> of every single side of the book. So but this is my, my, first, my first little uh, physical uh, copy of the book. Let's see, uh, Sarah, can we go to the next slide? So let me let me begin by reading a few things and then pointing out a few of these images here. So the United Farm Worker Movement, um, the UFW, otherwise known, originated in Central California in the San Joaquin Valley, which is a, a collection of rural small towns that produce various fruits, vegetables, and nuts that are consumed throughout the country. Uh, it originates in the early to mid 1960s. And in 1965, specifically in September, uh, the Lenos Filipino and Mexican grape workers initiated a strike in the region's vineyards, uh, especially table grape uh, vineyards, in order to demand higher wages and better working conditions. And you can look at the picture on the left. This is Cesar Chavez. Uh, Cesar Chavez is a critical figure in the UFW, and he is, I think, in many ways, the figure that is most represented in the history of the UFW. By this point, this is 1966, he has approximately 20 years of organizing experience. He's incredibly intelligent, and he has a very strong sense of what is possible and what people need to sacrifice in order to change their lives. And what he has in front of him right there is a map of the 1966 march from Delano, and he's pointing to Delano with the star, and the march that goes from every single small town that is available in the Central Valley, all the way meandering into the Sacramento region in order to gain as much attention as possible and pressure 
the governor to support your strike. Uh, next to him, you have a picture of Dolores Huerta, who's another major figure, also with a long history of organizing in farm worker and rural communities. Uh, Dolores Huerta is still with us, and she's still an organizer. Uh, I, as an aside, uh, in 2004 or 2003, I remember, I was working with a labor union, the uh, Hotel and Restaurant Employees Union, and they were in a campaign attempting to organized service workers in Palm Springs, and they had a civil disobedience action where I participated, we got arrested uh, to bring attention to labor in the Coachella Valley, and Dolores Huerta showed up to bring us uh, support. She was probably in her 80s then, uh, and, and continuing to make uh, the organizing that uh, is necessary. And then the picture in the very top, you'll see this is a classic image of the UFW, uh, marchers moving uh, in a fairly isolated region, usually agricultural regions, uh, very rural and, and very demanding. And they have a series of flags in front of them. They have a US flag, a Mexican flag, a UFW flag, and a, and a uh, Filipino flag, or a flag of the Philippines. And in the bottom, you'll see 1970. This is a very classic image of, of the UFW signing contracts with grape growers in, in the San Joaquin Valley in 1970. And next to Chavez with a cowboy hat, that's Larry Ilyong, who was uh, the critical leader of Filipino organizers in uh, the, organ the Agricultural Workers Organizing Committee. So these are the two figures who collectively, with the organizations that they're leading in Delano, who come together in 1965 and 1966 and eventually initiated this United Farm Worker Movement that is attempting to organize a labor campaign that recognizes the workers as having a union representative and in that union representative capable of organizing uh, the fields and transforming the working and living conditions. So this is overall uh, what the UFW kind of initiated and kind of begins. And this is kind of like the overall story that we tell of the UFW during this time period. Uh, can we go to the next slide? Now, let me read a little bit from here. So the organizationally, the UFW paired its rural Delano-based strike with a national grape boycott, where consumers were asked to stop buying table grapes in order to pressure the growers of California into union contracts that improve the conditions. Uh, through these contracts, the UFW wanted to have higher wages for all workers and then to sexual, uh, to sexual discrimination or harassment in fields the provision of organizing farm worker power in rural California, or simply the everyday respect that uh, many workers lack in both fields or otherwise in this period. The UFW's newspaper, which you see in front of you, uh, was named El Malcriado, and initially it played a critical role in the union's attempt to get farm workers to speak to each other. But by the 1966 and late 1960s, and by the time the 1970s comes around, the newspaper begins, plays a critical role in the union's boycott campaign of the late 60s and 70s. Uh, the newspaper usually presents consumers who are primarily white and middle class with farm workers who are primarily impoverished and non-white as part of the same national fabric and as people who are working together to transform rural California to, to reflect what is what were considered to be basic uh, material needs uh, in the United States. To the, through this strategy, through this strategy, strategy, this is I'm struggling to to pronounce. The UFW attempted to gain consumer support throughout the country, and then through that, pressure the growers to sign the contracts that I just noted earlier. Uh, can we do the next slide? And this is uh, some more pictures of Welga. You see. Uh, uh, this is a photo spread that opened uh, together, just kind of listed every single person uh, doing uh, some kind of action in the UFW. Next slide. And this is a picture of the strike. This is a, a El Malcreado issue from 1968. And you can see that there are reports from every single major city in the United States. There's Bakersfield, San Francisco, Portland on the west. You have Minneapolis, St. Louis, Buffalo, New York, Detroit. Um, in this initial boycott, many farm workers from rural California go to these big cities, create ties, they create ties with labor unions there, church groups and various uh, progressive organizations. And then they initiate a campaign to disrupt the consumption of table grapes. And in doing that, 
make it impossible for grape growers in California to ignore the UFW. Eventually, this boycott effort, in alliance with the, the farm workers' continuing strike, you have a farm worker union deal in 1970. Uh, can we go to the next slide, please? Thank you. So, and in this map, you have, so I'm going to go through the map in California, and then I'll come to the other map that you'll see in a minute. So the one in California, you'll see Delano is in the center. And you'll see that there's at the very end, at the very bottom, you'll see like a little blob, and that is the Salton Sea, okay? Uh, the union, the UFW, organizes in Delano, stays there for multiple years. And in 1968 to 1969, it moves the strike to the Coachella Valley. It expands the strike in the Coachella Valley as an attempt to, to force those growers into contracts, which were then pressure the growers in the Delano region into contract. And that's exactly what happens in the 1970s. The union will then initiate strikes and campaigns in lettuce fields in what is today Salinas, which is just south of San Francisco Bay Area, uh, or also the Imperial Valley, which is bordering the US-Mexico border. Uh, for those of you who do farm worker history, we know the Imperial Valley as a site of tremendous racial violence against farm worker organizing throughout the 20th century. And it's a region that is a beneficiary of uh, federal infrastructural projects that allow for the irrigation of desert lands that then produces winter harvest of lettuce fields and other, other other vegetables. So if you turn to, if you look at the images on the right, or at least it's my right, I'm not sure what it looks like for you, there are two maps. Uh, the top map, you see that there is a, uh, like a little lake that is as the Salton Sea, that is the blob that you see in the, in the California map. The Salton Sea, I can explain to you why it's there, uh, but it gives you a good sense that above the Salton Sea, you have the Coachella Valley. South of the Salton Sea, you have the Imperial Valley. And above it, you can see in the, in the, the, the next map, you can see that the Coachella Valley is surrounded by three mountains, the San, San, uh, San Jacinto Mountains on the left, and those are the mountains that are most emblematic of the Coachella Valley. Those are the pictures that everyone takes. Uh, and that uh, that is used for the Coachella Music Festival. They're very beautiful, and they're very um, uh, they're very I iconic. The mountains on the east are the mountains that are much smaller, arguably uh, less impressive, <laughs> less iconic, and those are the mountains that are the on the cover of the book. And I'll talk to you more in the Q and as to why as to why I chose that. Now, if you look at the map itself, you can see that a lot of the towns and and Sarah, if we can point to the to the map on the bottom. There we go. So you can see that the towns next to the Salton Sea are all kind of clustered together on the east end. And this is where, when, when white settlement comes into the region in the early 20th century, this, these small towns all become part of a kind of like a white archipelago of settler colonial relations. They're coming into native land. They're, they're saying that they, they own this land and that they are ultimately going to improve this land. This is a classic story in the U.S. West, and it's a story that is attempting to displace and racialize uh, the indigenous Korea from the region. It is these towns, these agricultural towns, that then are trying to build an agricultural industry in the 20th century, which grows dramatically after World War II. And for that to happen, what you need is a tremendous amount of labor organizers in the region. These labor organizers are primarily going to be Filipino and Mexican workers. There are other workers who are coming in, but it's primarily Filipino and Mexican, and then eventually it's primarily Mexican. Now, if you can see the towns, I don't know if you can if you can see them on your screen, but there are towns like Oasis, there are towns like Mecca, there are towns like Indio and Coachella, and then there are towns like Thermo. And much of this language is this attempt to describe this region in the desert as emblematic of America's Middle Eastern uh, Orientalist vision of land. And so they're growing table, uh, 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 dates. I don't know if anyone has like palm tree dates. I don't know if anyone has seen them. I grew up with them. They're like 95% of dates are produced in Coachella. And so, but they're like dates that were being imported and are becoming a big part of the industry. And then at the very tip over here, I don't know if you can, if you can point to it, uh, Sarah, there's Palm Springs. And this is a region that, uh, that is still connected to Los Angeles in the early 20th century. And that will grow further throughout the 20th century. And it is that, uh, uh, kind of a tourist-driven economy, uh, consumer-driven economy. It is that economy that produces the Coachella Music Festival that oftentimes erases the fact that there's a longer farm worker history in the region. So this is Coachella, right? 
Um, and this is where I want to, this is where the book is focused on. It's focused on these small towns. It's looking at people's everyday lives, their lives in schools, their lives in, in the fields, their lives in political uh, uh, contests. But it is also looking at the ways in which these workers are connected to people in Texas, uh, to people in the Northwest, uh, to people throughout the country, and then arguably people outside of the country. So in Mexico, the Philippines, or elsewhere. So, so can we go to the next slide? Thank you. So let me let me let me read a little bit uh, from from here, and then we'll go we'll go to the next the next few pieces. So, my book uh, focuses uh, the Strikers of Coachella focuses on pro UFW farm workers in the Coachella Valley after World War II. The region was then a small desert valley, but it had already grown substantially throughout the early 20th century by way of irrigation based agricultural development. By the 1960s, however. When the UFW and the Chicana Chicano movement erupted in the Coachella Valley and throughout California in the U.S. West, the Coachella Valley was understood by its residents, especially its non-white residents, as a racialized two-tier society in which primarily ethnic Mexican farm workers labored in fields controlled by white growers. These farm workers faced racial segregation and political disempowerment. They lived and impoverished uh, neighborhoods, they attended racist schools, and they shared very limited public spaces. The worst effects were concentrated among the most vulnerable, especially child laborers and women with abusive husbands. The growers, on the other hand, who farm workers often called ranchers in Spanish or rancheros, and this is why I, I talk about these men as ranchers. Uh, these ranchers seemed to have and to use everything that was available to the United States. They had nice homes, they had big cars, they had schools for their children, safety for their wives, political power for their interest. For many of the people who would join the UFW and the Chicanx movement in the 60s, their organizing attempts, whether it be in the fields or elsewhere, were an attempt to overhaul an entire society that had allowed for such extreme social inequality and marginalization. And I'll talk more about this as we go on, but one of the things that they say, or at least what the UFW is arguing, is that rural, Cali rural California or agricultural California could be described as something that they named the rancher nation. This is a nation in which ranchers had outsized power. They had allies in political structures, they had allies in schools, they had allies in the water board districts, they had allies in consumer organizations. All of these allies allowed the grower or the rancher to determine the conditions in which farm workers would live. And so they called the farm worker as someone who's responsible for both the life and the death of the farm workers who live in his nation. And so when we think of the UFW, we often argue that the UFW is trying to create better conditions and better uh, better working wages. But really what I see of the UFW is that, is that it's an attempt to reorganize rural California and agricultural California in order to eliminate the existence of a rancher nation. Okay. Now, the Coachella Valley included native Cahuilla. Uh, they had a growing black and Mexican community on the West End, and they had a substantial Japanese American grower class. Uh, these are all key populations, but they, they kind of they, they play a, a much smaller role in the book. Instead, the book is primarily following Mexican and Filipino farm workers who are attempting to negotiate their relationship to themselves, to each other, and into the organization in the context of increasing uh, precarity in post-war uh, US, but especially in late 20th century US. So, um, so what I'd like for you to do for the next, I don't know, let's see, 20 seconds, no, let's see, 30 seconds, 40 seconds, just take a look at this image, okay? And if you can, note down two or three observations that you that you notice. And you can just put it in the chat box or the, the yeah, I think that's possible. Is that correct, uh, Sarah? Yes, they can, they can uh, put into the chat what they see. Yeah, yeah, fantastic. So we'll take 30 seconds. This will give us a little break. I'm already I'm already losing my breath. <laughs> Thank you. 
Thank you, Selena Peña. Uh, Selena wrote strength uh, in the photos. Poverty and weariness, says Ina Sainz. Thank you for that. We'll wait about 20 more seconds. Full of sun, serious. Thank you, Selena. So let me... I'm going to, as we do this, and as you're looking at these images, and I wanted to make this a little interactive just for this very reason, uh, just so you can see some of the, the faces of farm workers in this region, okay? And this is, this is part of the introduction. So you'll get a sense of what this book, how this book sounds and what it's trying to do by way of its, by way of its syntax, its language. I'm hoping that it is a book that many people read and that it, it offers them a, a, a nuanced portrait of a movement that is so important to me, at least, uh, but to people, other people, including my students. So let me read from the book. So this is from the introduction. In the summer of 1969, the United Farm Worker newspaper, El Malcriado, published an A-photo spread titled The Striker of Coachella, two of Mexican women, two of Filipino men, and four of other farm workers and strikers. Some captured earnest moments like a young mother gazing out of her car while her bothered toddler looked at the camera, rubbing his eyes. Another framed a sitting man with elbows on knees and clasped hands, leaning forward expectantly, listening to his speech amidst others. A third angled upwards to a striker with microphone in hand uh, and eyes near closed, exhorting an out-of-view audience. The photos, however, also showed laughing, smiling faces of older men and women, of children, of light-hearted and quotidian moments, comforting even, without the attrition inherent to most rebellious acts like joining a farm worker strike. The photos appeared at the end of the UFW 1969 grape strike in the Coachella Valley. There, in 1969, Filipino and Mexican farm workers harvested the country's earliest table grapes, and there the UFW attempted to gain an early victory in order to pressure the much larger growers in the San Joaquin Valley to sign UFW contracts. By then, the UFW movement already counted four years since its 1965 Delano strike when they had demanded higher wages and a union contract. As the UFW gained its national prominence in the mid to late 1960s, the UFW also extended its Delano strike to the Coachella Valley in 1968 and 1969, with 1969 being the most important year of the strike for the UFW then. It also mounted an extraordinarily successful national consumer grape boycott. The newspaper, El Malcriado, as I mentioned earlier, served as a cultural and political bridge that tried to connect white, primarily middle-class consumers and to the UFW's racialized and impoverished membership, often arguing that they were the same. To these readers, the newspaper offered the 1969 photo spread as a testament of their shared fight for farm worker justice, inviting them to gaze solemnly, almost reverently, at their comrade in arms the strikers of Coachella. And yet, the newspaper provided no captions. It gave no names or quotes or backgrounds, nothing on what people saw, what they said, much less on what they had hoped for. The lack of information is especially surprising given the photo's visual splendor, its diversity of figures, its community of feelings and desires and stories. Arguably, the discursive austerity of any information reduces the very photograph of grape workers to mere silhouettes, to a homogeneous background that serves as a canvas for readers' fantasies. 
including the fantasy or the notion that they knew and understood the Coachella Valley farmworker strikers. Many years have since passed, but I would argue that this wishful thinking remains. The UFW now is, you know, streets and schools are named after UFW leaders, classrooms and museums routinely cover it. Some people have uh, adopted the UFW slogan, like Si Se Puede or Huelga. Uh, in 2008, the then candidate Barack Obama used Si Se Puede's translation, Yes We Can, to encapsulate an unprecedented campaign. And in the last 15 years, the UFW has been the subject of at least 10 academic books, a motion picture, and two documentaries. And yet all of these efforts, through all of the coverage of the UFW, the farm workers still exist through their very absence as background to mere leaders or as vague subjects of political virtue. My book, with the help of my advisors and my colleagues and my families and the people back home, is an attempt to return to the UFW's members, to its farm workers, to its people. It traces their intersecting lives in the Coachella Valley and their aspirations and actions in and out of the UFW. Like other social historians, I think I ask rather modest questions. Uh, questions like who joined and sustained the UFW? What lives had they lived? How did their past shape their relationship to the union? And how did their relationship to the union affect uh, their history? What did farm workers want? And what costs were they willing to bear? Who did they meet? What ideas and politics did they gain? How did they transform their world and communities? In short, I ask, how did they change their world and how did the world change them? And ultimately, uh, what remains of their efforts? Now, in order to tell this story, I've had to recognize that there is a diversity of human experience in the UFW. There are not only Filipino and Mexican workers, there are men and women, uh, citizens and not, children and older people, people who are married, people who have children, people who are not in either case. In order to be able to attend to that diversity, I think of the UFW not simply as an organization for farm worker rights, it is that, but it is also what I think of as a field, a discursive field of stories. Farm workers are coming to each other and telling stories to each other about who they are, who they wish to become, how and what are they willing to do in order to gain something much better for themselves and for their families. This, this Turning to the farm worker base then allows us to see a very dynamic, shimmering, and in many ways profoundly inspiring organization. At its most ambitious, uh, my book aims to move in rhythm with farm workers' steps and gazes, to consider the life lived in shaping choices, or the gamble that is to strike while poor and on white, or the palpable quality of holding aspirations for changes that always feel impossible and yet occasionally possibly real. The Strikers of Coachella tells a history of the UFW that moves beyond its leaders and shows how everyday people, our people, initiated and propelled forward movements and helped determine our present world. History, I tell my students, often sits among forgotten people. So this is what the book is about, right? So, um, I'll tell you more about it, but for now, I wanna take a little break and we can go to the next slide. Um, I want you to notice the photo. <laughs> this is 1988, 1989, as you'll see. See, this is Ms. Stern's class. Uh, and you see, these are all students who are attending John Kelly Elementary. It's the, the, the principal school in Thermal, in the Coachella Valley. And these are all five and six year olds, all children of farm workers children primarily of Mexican immigrants. And, and this is a all Spanish class. We all spoke, I didn't learn Spanish until I was like 10, I mean English until I, I was 10 years old. So your job right now is to look at the photos at all these little baby faces <laughs> and, uh, and ask yourself, which one am I? And try to identify me. And if you can, put it in the chat box. We'll do another 30 seconds. No guesses? Maybe not? I 
I, I have a guess. Yeah, which one do you think I am? I think it's the sweater vest, kid. It is. The, can we go to the next slide? <laughs> <laughs> Let's go to the next slide. Yes. There we go. This is my mom's fault, okay? My mom crossed the border in 82. She she wanted a little boy who would wear a, a clip-on <laughs> tie and uh, and a sweater vest. And I have, like, this little, like, little uh, uh, you know, a uh, little little smirk in my face. Uh, Sarah, can we go? <laughs> Thank you, Ines. <laughs> That's what my mother says. Uh, can we go to the next slide just so that we can see the baby? So now the reason why I'm showing you this, this is because this is in 1988, 1989. My book ends around this time period. Uh, all our parents are farm workers. Uh, most of us are living in poverty. Uh, I had fantastic parents. I have fantastic parents uh, who cared for me, who 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 loved me, and who offered me a world that uh, was very uh, unlikely for them and ultimately denied to them. Uh, but if you look at this photo, I, I think of three moments in my life. Um, three, I have three memories of this 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 community that I think, in many ways, encapsulates why I think this history of the UFW is important. You know, one memory was that I was a boy and we were playing in the playgrounds that were really old and ugly and dangerous and I ended up breaking my wrist. And I think now, I'm not a father, but I think about the possibility of a child sending them to a fifth, to a kindergarten class, I would have assumed that the school was in good conditions and our schools weren't. They were struggling, they were impoverished, they were segregated. Uh, we were lucky that we had Ms. Stern, but a lot of us were hurting in many different ways. So that was one. I just think of like one, like breaking my wrist at school because uh, our school's grounds were not great. The other one was that when I was a boy, when I was in that class, we learned, I think it was like 20 words in English. And I was just mesmerized <laughs> by the fact that I knew English. And I ran home. I remember from the kindergarten class, it bragged to my mother that I now knew another language. Um, and to me, this was a good this is a, an incredible opportunity for us that we, we had access to bilingual education. And these were programs that were established by pro UFW Chicano activists in the Coachella Valley. And it was that program that allowed me to learn English later on when I was in the fourth grade. And then the third piece that I, that I think of when I think of this, this region is that there's this, uh, if, I don't know if uh, Sarah, you can point, there's this girl with pigtails at the very back end. She has a pink dress or pink shirt, there we go. This, her name is Erendira. I don't know if Erendira is ever watching this, but Erendira had the most amazing hair. And we would sit in circles uh, like you do in kindergarten. And I would just run my hands through her, <laughs> through her hair. And I, I was just mesmerized by her. I didn't I associate nothing with it. But I remember Ms. Stern once pointed it out. And I wondered now if that was a way that I was being identified as a queer boy in our home, where I was not, ident I was not behaving in gender normative ways. And so that's, this is also a theme in the book. So the idea here is not only to speak about farm worker communities and the inherent dignity of our families and their attempt to make a better world for their children. It was also, it's also recognizing that our communities have a lot of work to do uh, in order to provide a space for all of us. Uh, so this is, this is a, a, a kindergarten. A few years later, Coachella would name its first elementary school after Cesar Chavez. And by, 19, by then, the early 1990s, by then, um, I have to say, very few people that I knew of ever talked about uh, the UFW, much less of the Chicano movement. Many of us, many of our families had just crossed the border. Many of us were contained in work that was very dangerous, very disempowered, and without documentation or limited documentation, even after IRCA, uh, many families were attempting simply to survive. Uh, there's a, there's a question here, do I remember? I remember not only all of them, I see them often in Coachella and there are two cousins of mine who are, who are there right now, so in the, in the photo. So uh, can we go to the next slide? These, so if you, if you like this book, if you wanna learn more about Coachella, Teatro Chicana and Butterfly Boy are both books that are covering the 1970s, 1980s and 1990s. And you can see this transition of a UFW movement that was incredibly significant in the region that overall loses its ability to shape the languages and the histories of that space. So much so that Rigoberto Gonzalez, the one in the middle, Butterfly Boy, he talks about 
uh, this history as a re at this land as a region that offers him no alternative other than to escape by going to college, which was which was not the case beforehand. Beforehand, college was a space to come back and transform a region that was in the process of being transformed by these movements. And by in fact, by the 1990s, when Cesar Chavez Elementary was being uh, named after uh, Cesar Chavez, the UFW leader, I remember. That, pe uh, that most people thought it was the boxer, Julio Cesar Chavez, right? He was, a, he was our guy, <laughs> he was our community leader. It wasn't this other labor organizer that I think we desperately needed to learn about. Can we go to the next slide, please? This is how the Coachella Valley is known, right? This is Bad Bunny, right? These are the golf courses. This is where my parents uh, often worked. They worked either in the fields or they worked in the service industry. My father worked in golf courses. The entire region is predicated on poverty wages. It is a region that is segregated by race, segregated by class, and that is often predicated on the erasure of everyday people's lives. And you can see, like from the desert of the cover of the book, this green landscape that is a manufactured space. It is a space for people to go to Coachella to kind of uh, live their fantasy of a desert landscape of art and culture, of leisure, of, um, of, of, of sports like golf, but it has very little to do with the real farm worker base of people who are still producing our grapes, our citrus, our dates. Uh, can we go to the next slide, please? This region was incredibly devastated during the pandemic, right? So if you're interested in, corona, in the coronavirus or COVID-19 and its impact on farm workers, uh, what it does is that it it just magnifies the oppression that was already existing in the early 21st century. And it solidifies it by way of taking away our, many of our political leaders. Uh, two of our priests died in Mecca, many of the leaders in the Catholic Church, and many of our students or our children's parents. Uh, if you're interested in this, I've just wrote an article. I'd be more than happy to share it with you. Can we go to the next slide, please? Um, you can see more. Of, of what this is, revealing the invisible Coachella Valley, uh, coronavirus devastates California farm workers, et cetera. Can we go to the next slide? So this is the book. The book is long. <laughs> I couldn't stop writing. Uh, it has uh, eight, I mean, not eight parts, sorry. It has four parts. Um, and you can see that the first part is, is laying the groundwork to show you what is the context, uh, who built the valley, how was it built? What were the stories being told? And it's also looking at who are these workers and what are the stories that they're bringing from the early 20th century, if not the late 19th century. These are stories of Filipino uh, uh, rebellion against US colonialism. It is stories of Mexican rebellion against uh, landed uh, property elites during the Mexican revolution. But it's also stories of migrants trying to make life available to themselves in the mid 20th century. Often stories that are gendered, stories that are raised, stories that are, uh, are visionary about the possibilities if we just get a break. The next part two is looking at the UFW and the Chicano movement and what is envisioning, what, it, what are some of the, the liberatory visions that they're thinking of and how are they thinking of structuring their world. Uh, this, is, this is riffing off of the work of uh, Robin D.G. Kelly who has a book on freedom dreams. These are these are dreams about freedom. These are maps about a better world that is often not visible unless we start thinking about utopian futures. And then part two, part, part three and part four, look at the complicated nature of this campaign, the ways in which roars coalesced against the UFW, and then how the country as a whole, the whole United States country, turns rightward in the late 20th century, devastates all unions, attacks all social movements, and then solidifies a right-wing uh, uh, political structure that we currently continue to live under. And in fact, where I think we're, we're starting to witness the last desperate, desperate gasps uh, with, uh, with the last president. And in chapter 10, that's a little bit more of this retelling of my life in the region as a way to talk about the afterlives of this movement. I do not think that the UFW uh, failed in many ways or that the Chicano movement failed. In many ways, it provided the foundation for a resurgent movement today. Uh, we're not in the same place that we used to be in the 60s. We have new professors now. We have people who are political leaders now. We have these organizations. And ultimately, I think it is important that we start to consider what is what does the 21st, 
21st century look like uh, for, for our farm worker comrades in this country? Can we go to the next slide, please? So here are some images of El Malcriado. Uh, you can kind of see some of the politics of the UFW with the first photo. This is a farm worker in the 1970s. Uh, this is a picture that I think is trying to embody the hopes for the future, right? This man who's standing upright, no longer working with the short handle hole, looking at the sun. And even if he's laboring, and even if it's hot, even the sun looks like it's inspiring him, almost like a humanity that was denied to the worker. It is a very gendered image. You can notice that it's a man laboring and that it's women and a child that he is protecting. This is uh, not something I discovered in the, organ in the oral history interviews. In fact, much, much of the people I interviewed were women who insisted that they were attempting to use the UFW as a way to challenge the patriarchies in farm worker communities. If anything, you would see a, a collection of women and men with long handle holes, and that would have been the hopes for the future for the rank and file in Coachella. The other photo, you can see that this is the classic image of the rancher nation, of growers using the law, judges, and police to sit on top of the farm workers. Can we go to the next slide? Uh, this is a picture from, I, I want to say, the 19, late 1960s. The question is, what are we fighting for? And in many ways, uh, they're fighting to give their children a better future, and also to give them a better future by of reminding them that their parents uh, fought for them. There's a for me the this union is an incredible act of love, um, a caretaking, uh, uh, in order to carve out a space that includes life uh, for their families. Can we go to the next slide? And then here you get an image of this is from the 1973 strike in Coachella. Uh, you can see the quote below. It says. Uh, the strike is reserved very exclusively to those men and women of great courage who are committed to struggle and sacrifice to defend their rights and those of all the people. And this is from, this is Travis speaking to an audience in Coachella. And I think in many ways, it, it, it really encapsulates uh, how for, for many of the rank and file members of this union, uh, these were moments of tremendous possibility. And for many of them, it was a, these were moments of, of tremendous transformations. Um, most of them, I think, would say that this history is of deep, deep, deep value for us today as we consider a, a century of, of, of daunting challenges, including climate change, um, waves of, of migrants who need our advocacy, and then ultimately an attempt to negotiate our relationship to, to this country. So I think we can learn a lot from the UFW. Uh, next slide. And I think that's it. Any questions? Oh, thank you so much, Christiana. I, I'm going to take this slides down for a minute. And certainly, if anyone has questions that they would like to ask, please just put them in the chat and we'll, we'll try to answer them. But I was wondering if you could tell us a little bit about the approach to the book, my understanding is that it, in, it includes some 200 oral histories. And where did those oral histories come from? Uh, how, were they, how were they collected? Fantastic. So, so it's 200 hours of oral histories. Uh, oh, 200 hours, okay. 200 hours. So there are about, I want to say 73 participants. Uh, these these were people who are primarily farm workers and or Chicana and Chicano activists. Uh, they, they were not in any way, they, um, and many of them were done over time, uh, so repeatedly. And at the end of the book, you'll see all the dates and all the hours of the interviews. And I wanted to show people how it is something that developed over time and in dialogue with them. Um, you know, because in many ways I had very, very, very little limited knowledge of that space. So that's so 200 hours of original oral histories. But then I also used a uh, a ton of oral histories that were already available. So I listened to about 80 oral histories of Braceros who worked in the Coachella Valley. I listened to approximately another hour, 150 hours of oral histories that are available in two different archives. Uh, oftentimes these were not farm workers in the Coachella Valley, but they provided enough of a portrait of what agriculture was in California overall. 
In addition to that, I collected archives from uh, the UFW's central office, in De uh, not central office, but central archives in Detroit, a bunch of archives throughout California. If you look behind me, I have a ton of notebooks. All of these are archival collections. And so it was very much an attempt to kind of piece together a story that can sustain enough of a potential critique. I mean, this is a very contested history. It's a very contested field. And I wanted to make sure that uh, what I was offering was um, not only reliable, but pretty convincing. So so that was that was the method. Okay, without giving up too much, um, one of the things that um, you sometimes hear about United Farm Workers is that in its creation, it, it was the merging of two different unions. And, and you talk about how in, in your book, you explore both the uh, experience of Mexicanos and Filipinos can, can you maybe just give us sort of a high level overview of how did those communities um, get along or not in, Coach, in the Coachella Valley? I think it's a, so I think in, it's, it was a, it was a, it's a complicated story. So one, so the people who are part of the union, the people who would consider themselves militant, uh, there are people who see their work as almost sacred. Like, and, and it's not just that they're religious. Many people are religious, but many people see this as uh, an embodiment of their parents and grandparents' labor. And so for them, being part of a movement like this and, in, and, and, and taking on the sacrifices that, that it requires becomes a testament of who they are, of what they stand for, of what who they want to become and who they want to be allied with. The people who do that often see each other very easily across gender, across race, across class. Uh, maybe they don't see each other in that, maybe there's some, uh, some gaps in each other. Most people, however, are not those folks. Most people are incredibly dedicated, but also very intelligent about what are they willing to bear? What are they willing to put their children in? What are they willing to, to, to risk on? Uh, those people oftentimes existed in much more ethno-specific communities and often didn't see each other, including Filipinos not seeing Mexicans, Mexicans not seeing Filipinos. That then a facilitator allowed for increasing tensions or not even tensions, bitterness or uh, frustrations or a sense of not being represented by the union. This is especially the case for Filipinos as in the 1970s, as the fortunes of the UFW get a little more tricky. So it becomes this, um, it, it's almost like a missed opportunity and yet it's also a very human dynamic, I think. Mm -hmm. And it also, and it shows us that in order for us to consider the future of a, of a coalition or to think about cross-racial coalitions, I think we need to make every effort possible to learn everyone's histories <laughs> as much as we can. Mm -hmm. This is where relational race formation, this is where relational Latinx, this is where your organization and the ties that we make with black communities, with Asian communities, with native communities, or with communities throughout the world. This, this is the work of Chicano studies. Our work is not nationalist, our work is, uh, is coalitional. It is, uh, it is ultimately inter, uh, intersectional. And it's, I, I think it's in trans, transnational. And so I think that's, so that's what I try to lay out. I try to show the ways in which people miss each other. And yet at the same time, understand why they're missing. Like people are putting their lives on the line. And sometimes mm -hmm. they just don't know each other's history. And one person who, incredible young woman, she's 19 years old. She's telling me that she didn't go to college because racist schools. I mean, she didn't go to high school. It's racist schools, they, they called her a Mexican, all that stuff that we know of, right? didn't speak Spanish, couldn't speak Spanish, that kind of stuff. Uh, and also because of uh, the gender politics of her family who didn't necessarily encourage her to go to school. I mean, they weren't necessarily uh, the patriarchy that I see in other, in other families, but this was, a, this was a family that kind of shied away from pushing her, their daughter, the way that they were pushing their children to go, their, their boys to go to college. Um, so she gets involved in the union as a way to escape farm worker status, as a way for her to see the world. To, to, to think about possibilities. These are new people coming into the region, right? And so she wants mm -hmm. to meet them, you know? She was stuck. And she meets uh, Larry Ilion and P. Velasco, who are critical uh, uh, Filipino leaders. And, and they try to convince her to go to college and they offer to pay for college. Now for her, she understood this as a gesture of their feminism, a gesture of their interracial coalition politics. But she had no idea that for many of these Filipino men, the reason why they migrated to the UFW was an attempt to get an education that was immediately dashed from them. 
And so these are men who are 60, 70 years old. There's no way that these young 19 year olds is gonna understand this history. But for these men who have lived a life of increasing denial over and resistance, who were not allowed to go to school and who then have to inhabit the racialized category because of this denial, they're trying to offer her something different that she can't see, right? Because she's trying to, to, to lead a movement. She's trying to fight an entire capitalist class in the 1960s. And that, I think, is that, that tension of possibility and real limits that I think I try to foreground. And then from there, what does it ask from us, the readers? It's a lot easier to, to, to critique people in the past for their choices, but it's a lot harder to actualize the very things that people did. I have never been on a strike. And I think it's easy for my students or for my colleagues or for other historians to make claims of what they would have done differently if they had been there. I'm not sure if anyone can talk unless you've actually done it. So that's what I would say. Yeah. So it's a complicated story, but I think it's a yeah. one to be told. And I think I do a pretty decent job, <laughs> if I can say <laughs> so. Okay. Well, I want to turn it to a couple of audience questions. One question is, what do you believe is the contemporary movement for Latinos? Oh, well, I I don't I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. I, I think there are many different movements, but I think uh I think that the next movement that I think we need to do is that we need to I'm listening to a book right now that is estimating that somewhere about between 1.5 to 4 billion humans are going to have to migrate as a result of climate change. These are people from the global south. Uh, it's not just Latin America, right? Global South, including Africa and South Asia, the Middle East and East Asia. I think the next Latino movement is that we need to work really hard to, to meet these people before they arrive so that we open the border for them. Nothing else matters. We need to open the border to allow every single person who's escaping the effects of our country. I think that's the next movement. Our movement will be about um, reminding our nation, what it needs to stand for, and fighting really hard for people who are not yet here, even people that we don't know just yet, even people who are not Latin American. I think people think of, of Chicanos are often like, yeah, well, of course we'll open the door, man. I'm cool with Salvadorians, I'm cool with Nicaraguense, I'm cool with Colombians, but no, but what about Bengalis? What about Kenyans, right? Those are the po folks that we need to understand, that we need to speak their language, and we need to say they are kin, they are our people, and they, they need to be welcomed. I think that's the next, I think that's what we need to do. Um, one of the viewers, um, um, Chayo Flores Zaldivar, is originally from India and wants to know if there's still a labor camp in existence, maybe on Van Buren? Yeah, there is, and it's in the same conditions. Well, actually, they've done a little better better uh, work on it. But uh, Mariposa Boy takes place in um, in the, the the camp itself. So if if you grew up there, it's a, it's a heavy memoir, but it's really beautiful and it's done by a poet. Okay, um, there's another question about um, military veterans in the, in the UFW. So Chavez was a veteran and I never hear about the role of veteranos in the UFW. In your research, did you get a sense of the role of vets? Was there a veteran community involved? Entirely, yeah. And I write about this in chapter two and chapter three. Uh, there are many different politics that are being produced by veteranos. A lot of it is uh, people's relationship to citizenship and what it means and what discourses are going to be used. But veterans create the organizations that will then provide the foundations for the UFW, including the Mexican American Political Association. And a lot of the people that I met who are, they're not just veterans, they're veterans and they're small business owners or they're veterans and they're teachers or they're veterans of some kind of profession that, so it's a very cross-class alliance that is taking place in order to get rid of this racialized category that they think of as the rancher nation. Yeah. I see. Okay. Well, um, I think that that's the end of our audience questions. And a, no a number of people saying, well said, and thank you. Uh, thank you so much for sharing your knowledge with us tonight, Dr. Pais. Um, I, I just want to say thank you to everybody who watched tonight. Thank you for joining us. I also want to thank our funders, including the City of San Antonio, Bear County, AARP, Wells Fargo, the National Trust for Historic Preservation, the Texas Historical Foundation, and individual donors like you. If you like tonight's presentation, I encourage you to learn more about Macri at somosmacri.org. 
we regularly host virtual talks like tonight's talk, and we're building the nation's first museum dedicated to Mexican-American civil rights history, and we need your support. Please visit our website, subscribe to our newsletter, and follow us on social media. Again, Dr. Pais, thank you so much for sharing this knowledge with us tonight. I hope everybody has a great night, and we hope to see you if, at the march on Saturday if you're here in San Antonio. Okay. Thank you very much, Sarah. Thank you for everybody for, for coming, and I'm, I'm excited about your work. Thank you. Oh, thank you.